This season on Camp Fatu. Fatu. Oli. In the history of the Gambia, Gambia Printing Publishing Corporation proudly introduces the Bibliomatic Exercise Book Printing Machine. The machine has the capacity to print more than 20,000 books per hour. Yes, 20,000 books per hour. It also prints magazines, newspapers, calendars, flyers, normal books, and all kinds of printed documents plus items at affordable prices. With the Bilomatic printing machine, GPPC can now render high quality and non size restricted printing service supply across the sub region. Rush now and partner with GPPC for all your public and private printing service needs. Print with us today and you'd be offered highly professional, reliable, and efficient service delivery by our team of experts. The Gambia Printing and Publishing Corporation is here to meet all demands and is reliable at all times. For more info, contact us on 437-4493 or 437-4402. GPPC is Gambian and it's yours. When we touch down, but I broke down. Gamtel G Fiber, now you can enjoy super fast internet in gigabytes. G Fiber is affordable, stable, secured, and accessible to homes, businesses, and enterprises. With Gamtel G Fiber, the future is speed. Gamtel, creating a brighter future in communication. Hello and welcome to this special interview. Uh, it seems like I always have Esa on special interviews only on Kirfatu. Uh, one more time, Kiesa, welcome to Kirfatu for the first time as a candidate. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm a political novice, uh -huh. so a new entrant in the scene. So uh, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> all, all at your disposal. It sounds so funny though, you, you, you know, a politician. Gamsel data, now even better. Enjoy 20% extra data on all Gamsel data bundles. Buy 20 megabytes and get extra 4 megabytes. Buy 50 megabytes and get extra 10 megabytes. Buy 100 megabytes and get extra 20 megabytes. Any amount of Gamsel data bundle you buy, you will receive 20% extra data for free. Dial star 302 star. Data amount hash. Or go to your Yaiburum menu and choose your data bundle now. Gamsil data. It's fast, lasts longer, and very reliable. Gamsil Yaiburum. But how has it been 24 hours since you announced, almost 24 hours since you announced your, your bid for the presidency? How has the reaction been like since yesterday? The whole country is in a frenzy. People are excited. Gambians are realizing that, yes, it is indeed possible to have very educated, exposed and enlightened Gambians to come onto the national stage with the sole objective of trying to help participate in national building, trying to help take over our country again and reorganize things ensure a turnaround by entrusting the country in the hands of the best and brightest of this country to, to put it on the course for development. Uh, so a lot of people are excited. Uh, my telephone didn't stop ringing since yesterday, since the announcement. 
This is something Gambians have been yearning for, and they did not have. Or at least they did not have candidates that really satisfied uh, their, their expectations. Of course, I would not be arrogant enough to say that uh, they're not very educated people in the race. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are. But I think my candidacy brings something special. It brings something special because of who I am and what I represent and my experience. So that makes me unique so I in want a to, lot of ways. I want to come there. You, you said something, um, take our country back. Take our country back from who? We take our country back from those who are in charge. For one important reason, we want to believe that it is absolutely important that our country is run by the most capable people in this country. The most capable being based on achievement, being based on merit, and not just the politics that we used to practice. So. We want to have our country back into the hands of people we believe are most capable of running the country, most capable of delivering on the aspirations of the Gambian people, people who have a track record of succeeding, people who we know have integrity. We, I mean, Gambians had for the most time, uh, the politics of this country was based on parochial values. You know, Badinya Fasa, Bombo Kanais, as we have it in Wolof. It's mm -hmm. the same thing. Yeah. It's the same thing. So, so we want to do away with that kind of politics. We want to jettison that. So we want a politics in which it is a competition of ideas and one in which people would choose knowledge over ignorance. People would choose e e excellence over mediocrity. If you look at say, the public service in this country. I mean, before Jami, Gambia used to be rated as one of the second best public service or civil service institutions in Africa. We have lost that since then. Well, Jami told us that he had two, two million Gambians to choose from, and you know what that meant. So the public service was I mean, he played ping pong with it, or he played, how do you call it, um, musical chairs, and uh, people were sacked, brought, brought back, sacked, brought. So he pretty much desecrated the, 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 the public service. Uh, but I would blame him alone. I mean, a lot of Gambians also we are not available to be appointed to these public Th services. That's why I wanted to come in. So, yes. yeah. I wanted to come there because you said, um, you said um, the country should be ruled by people who have capabilities, people who can do it, like who have the qualification. And it brings to the famous question, where were all of you? The educated ones, the good ones. Uh, you were busy 20 years ago. You said yesterday, 20 years in, in the international scene. You, you, had all, you have all of it. Um, education, experience, connections, name it. You have a fine CV. And the last time we had an interview, I was amazed when we looked at your career. You, 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 you dine and wine with people with power, and you had the best CV any Gambian would ask for. But all of you, where were you 20 years ago when all these people were dating their hands, trying to get the country out of the woods? And today, when everything is is level and it's better and you guys come and say oh we should give the country to the to the educated to the elites uh, why where were you 20 years ago when we needed SFI? where was i when other people were dirty in their hands mm -hmm. well i was there right there with them but in the background in the background because i was an international civil servant and there are rules I could not come out in the forefront. But those who matter know whether I have contributed or not. But I know I have contributed mm -hmm. what I could. But the important thing, the problem that I raised yesterday mm -hmm. is the fact that 
a lot of us were more concerned about our own personal individual well-being yeah. and not necessarily that of the country. Uh, we were willing to resign to say, ah, Gambia, Dara yeah. And then we stayed away and uh, feathered our own nests and take care of, took care of ourselves and our families. And that is the truth. I would not sigh away from the truth and I would not extract myself from that group. All right? But, I mean, a lot of us thought mm -hmm. that, well, this is just the best response under the situation. Because even then, you know, if, if one were to start making noise, nobody would listen. That was the situation. So the problem is not, in fact, a one-way street. It, it, the problem is actually who we are as a people. What are the things that we value? What are the things that make us tick? Gambians are too patient. We are too patient to a fault. We are prepared to put up with a situation, yeah. no matter how bad it is, for the longest time. But that is who we are as a people, you know? And that is why we put up with injustice for the longest time. It took a lot for us to change. I mean, it took a lot for us to change the last regime, Yeah. all right? And it would also take a lot for us to change this regime. And that's why I am going into politics, because I do believe that I have the capacity and the capability to help make that change. I believe I would win. You believe you God would win. Willing. God willing. And then um, you came to the limelight. You became a household name in 2018, loved by everybody. The whole country would sit and watch your way of doing your work at the TRC. At what point and when did you make this decision that you, you wanted to run? Uh, look, it, it, it was not... I wouldn't say it was this particular day okay. that I made the decision to run. Uh, this was a long process. Mm -hmm. In 2016, when Jame fell, I was in Dakar. Mm -hmm. And I had to receive a lot of Gambian families and put them up in my building. And that time, I felt the pain. For the first time, as far as I can recollect, Gambians are now becoming refugees in other countries. Mm -hmm. I, together with others, helped to pay for journalists to go across the border to come into Gambia and to Karan area and be sending reports out you know, for what was going on. I, you know, I have worked internationally for the longest time, and I had come, out, come across a lot of refugees in my life. I mean, in the Darfur cases, I had to go to some of the biggest refugee camps in the world, like Kalma and so forth, in Kenya and so forth, in order to interview victims from, from Darfur. Mm. But this time around, I had to receive refugees from my own okay. country, people who I know, and the pain of that, you know, the uncertainty that surrounded that period, and the risks that I understood our people were taking. I realized that we were in a crisis situation. And this crisis was happening because of the absence of the rule of law. Mm. It was happening because there were not, not many people who would stand up and be saying no to what was going on until it had gotten to that stage. And I said to myself, but what is it that some of people like me are really doing that is impacting this situation and making sure that this thing would stop? And then I said to myself, well, uh, you know, maybe someday I should just enter politics. But it was just maybe some idle talk, mm. you know, and I forgot about it. When I started the TRRC, I mean, many people will come to our house and try to talk to my parents to get them to let me run. Mm. 
But my house, like I explained yesterday, yeah. they don't talk politics. So I have explained this story. Yeah. So I was always isolated and uh, ensure that I wouldn't be influenced by any political talk. But one time, I didn't know that my dad was convinced by, by some groups. And uh, I came home and, you know, he started talking. And anyway, the conversation got into him suggesting that, you know, it is people like me who are really the problem in this country because um, we are not prepared to make the sacrifices that they were able to make or prepared to make during, during their time. Uh, you know, my father had always been a teacher. Mm. Uh, he taught all his life, about 50-something years as a teacher, or 60-something years as a teacher. You know, so, I mean, I mean, at it, that point. It, it was just for me. Uh, at first, I could not believe what I was hearing, mm -hmm. because this is my dad who's always protected me away from politics. Perfect. And now he's suggesting that we are responsible, we are to be blamed for what has happened, because we've decided to run away and be concerned mainly about our P grade, our paycheck, and the designer shoes we wore and stuff like that, and not concerned about the general welfare of the Gambian people. That got me thinking, really, and it changed my life. And I recall one day, the, you know, if I say this, people might not believe it, mm -hmm. but the last few words I have ever heard my mom utter clearly was to call me Mr. President. Wow. Wow. She had a stroke and uh, it developed into a speech problem and uh, she lost her speech. And uh, the last statement I ever heard her utter clearly was to call me that. And that too shocked me because, you know, Wow. Wow. So. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. But, uh, you know, you know, life is mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. But uh, I, that was just, I just laughed over that. Yeah. Uh, I just laughed over that. Uh, but the conversation with my dad really got me thinking. I did not decide there and then that I would do it. Um, this was just before COVID bro broke, so I had to go around the country to help provide food aid to families. Because the first day that COVID was announced in Gambia, I was so panicked. I had very little money, but I withdrew it all from the bank. And, and I decided, I thought maybe I should help some families because what I believe was going to happen was crazy. You know, you, you recall uh, the Millennium Bug yeah. when we thought that uh, the yeah. computers wouldn't be able, able to change to, from 1999 So it's better to, to take 2000. all your money because you didn't know what was happening at the banks. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mm. <laughs> so I, I was that panic stricken mm. and I went to the bank, took out the little money I had That there. must be a lot of money. No, no, no. <laughs> it wasn't much, to be quite candid. But I bought about 30 bags of rice and all these little, little things. And I just drove, you know, beyond Birkama towards the Fonis, and I distributed it all. You know, aided by a friend. We had two vehicles and, you know, distributed it all. And then I came back. Uh, but then, you know, the COVID, it's like it was never ending. So a few days thereafter, some groups contacted me, and then we started the, yeah. the, the GNF uh, uh, food aid, uh, which took me all over the country. country. What I saw during that period was really terrible. I saw Gambia as it is, raw. You it's said really something sad. yesterday that was uh, really sh shocking. You said you went around the country. 90% of the areas, the government was not present. 
Yes. There were no hospitals, there were no schools, there was no... Was yes. that shocking for you? Because that's your first time going around the country, no, right? No, look, I had lived in the provinces. Provinces, yeah. Uh, my father was headmaster for Rafinha Secondary School. Yeah. But that was a long, long time, time ago. ago. 1976 mm -hmm. or thereabout. I was a little kid when I was there. Uh, I mean, my father was headmaster Sukuta Secondary. And I was a little kid. I, you know, but that doesn't mean that I, since then I haven't been to the provinces. I've been to several places in the provinces. Okay. But the thing is, I, did, I had never taken a tour to of the country. country. In like the way did. I did this time. I mean, this time around, I went from Katong to Koina, mm -hmm. from Banjul to Buduk. And I saw the country, real Gambia, for the first time. And I was shocked. A lot of our people wallow in absolute poverty. It is very sad. There is no trace of government in most of the places I have been to. No hospitals, no schools, nothing, no facility. Even drinking water is a problem in a lot of the villages. That's the Gambian reality. So, and it kept me thinking, this is terrible. We were so shocked by our country. We were so shocked by the poverty. We were so shocked by the need of the people. We were walking from 7 a.m. until midnight just to make sure that the, at least the food we had would get to the homes of those who needed the most. Because we could not help the entire country. We could help only 5,000 families. We wanted to distribute it across the whole country you know, and make sure we distribute it fairly and to the most needy people. We were not satisfied to just go and dump 100 bags of rice at the house of the Alcalo and say distribute. No. We went and assessed the homes ourselves and determined who are those who needed it the most and those who well, are better off than the others. But you would see that in some places, really, it's almost lucky dip because they are all just almost on the same level. So did you use, uh, did you at any point in time um, during the distribution of the food aid and also your appearances at the TRRC use your political ambitions to the detriment of the victims? Your critics would say you use the TRRC platform to, 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 to showcase your political agenda. Would you say, you, did you ever do that during any of these times? Well, that would be a foolish argument to make. Uh, but people are entitled to their opinions. Uh, you know, my critics would always look to find something. And the easiest thing to look <laughs> is at the TRRC. And uh, there is no easier, easier blame to make than to say that, oh, I use the success of the TRRC for my own political ends. Of course, I have to be who I am. If whenever you go for a job interview, you have to present who you are. TRRC is part of me. I have explained that yesterday. It's part of me. Mm. I cannot run away from it. But if I had done a bad job, well, the people would not support me. Yeah. So if I have done a good job and the people think that they should support me, what's wrong with that? But in fact, I think it reinforces the important principle that, I mean, we should give jobs to people who deserve it. We should give positions to people who merit it. And that good work, quality work, can lead to other things. Shouldn't we promote that? The culture that, well, if you do very well, it can lead to other things. I think the concern here is um, the TRRC, yes, you have finished your work. Um, you have not uh, presented the work to the presidency. And the presidency, um, this is the government, the government that enacted this TRRC is the same government that you are seeking to remove from office. Um, do you think the government in any way will 
try to even validate the report because they always think, oh yes, he was trying to get a political point. And I think this was a concern that so many people have. You, don't you think that was a, a legitimate concern? It's not a legitimate concern at all. Uh, in the TRRC, there's a division of responsibility. Yeah. I was the lawyer. My responsibility was to present the case of the people. It's the, for the commissioners to make a final decision on the issues. I could help them in the process, but it's the commissioners who make the final decision on the issues. I don't make them. All right? I have finished my work at the TRRC. It's over. It's done with. So I can pursue other endeavors. OK, all these parties, mm. uh, or all these contenders who are saying this, if I had decided to go and join them, they would have me. That's true. But you see why, I, why they're criticizing but me? It's because I have decided not to join them. But you are, you are going to join them in different capacities, right? But even if I joined them, what would you think? I am going to be a senior clerk in one of the ministries. And most of us would have preferred Esther to wait until after the white paper was out. No, no. That is a waste of time of the Gambian people and, uh, and a way to deprive the Gambian people uh, of an opportunity to consider a candidate that is different from, the, from, from, from what is available. Just look at it this way. You know, there's a big fire going on you have one of your best firefighters and you ask him, no, you have to wait until the report of your last firefight to come in before you are allowed to participate in this one. No, 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 no. I Why would not have it. Why do you think it. you are the best in, the, in this in, right now? Why do you think you are the best to take Gambia to the next level? Um, because you're just saying um, the country, that is good, the country cannot wait because the country needed somebody like you, right? But why do you think you are the best? Uh, look. If you ask any one of the candidates, they will tell you they're the best. Yeah. It would be foolish to, to get into the race if you do not think you're the best. I would endorse the best if, if I knew, if I believed that I wasn't the best. I want you, yes. but, but, yeah. but, but let me make this point clear. Mm -hmm. We all have short CVs yeah. that spell out what we have done with our lives. Compare. It's quite easy. I I know I am the only one of them who's worked in three international organizations with distinction. The United Nations, the International Development Law Organization, and the International Criminal Court. I am the only one who worked at the technical level as a diplomat, and I did it with distinction. I am the only one of them who's done a lot of justice sector reform and governance reform around the world, not just in Gambia, but around the world. Okay? Well, there is none amongst them who is a more successful businessman than I am. So if you put, and I want to imagine that I would be one of the better lawyers, too. Hmm. So if you put all that together, I have a wealth of experience. That would that would that 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 could come to bear that could be uh, made to bear on the on, on this job. I am not monodimensional, like a lot of the candidates, the other candidates. I don't want to name names. I want to be always absolutely respectful uh, to the other candidates. I hold them all in high esteem, and I know that all of them have the country at heart. I know. Or oh, that's what I would want to believe. But I also do know that I am different. The CVs speak for themselves. Take a look at it. I have a culture of succeeding in everything that I did. The last one is the TRRC. Well, the, talk, the TRRC, we, we, cannot tell, we cannot say the success of the TRRC as we speak. Come on. The success of the TRRC <laughs> depends on the report no, being out. No, no, no. The, that is a big fundamental mistake. Oh, and let me okay, tell you something. Tell me. Let, what, let me tell you. Okay, how, how, why do you say the TRRC is successful? Look, the purpose of the TRRC is to bring out the truth. That yeah. is the most important Wasn't thing. Yes. Don't the Gambians know the truth already about what has happened? We do know the truth. Exactly. But we don't have justice. Yet. No, 
But justice is not a matter for the TRRC. Justice is a matter for government doing the right thing, prosecuting those they believe be a greater responsibility. A TRRC report could bring that out. That's what I'm saying. That's what I was going to say. I'm saying could a, bring that out. A proper, a good TRRC report and a good recommendation <laughs> would... That adds to the success. But, but, but that doesn't mean that the TRRC is not already successful. But already, and let me tell, already, let me tell already, you Let, let, me, me, say, tell let you me come in here. Already, the reason why I'm bringing this angle, already your critics and the opposition and the people are, who are in politics, which is over f maybe 50% of the population, are saying that the TRRC already is a failure because of you declaring your candidature. Over 50% of the population. I mean the, I mean the opposition, the people that, you know, but, but I mean the people, that are in, the people that are in politics. And if that's the way people are looking at it right now, are you not concerned are, about that? Are you talking about the people or are you talking about my political opponents. Who are you talking the about? The people and their supporters. The political opponents and their supporters. So all their supporters are saying... 90% of them. But that is not the Only case. Only most... That is not the case. I, I would want to see the statistics you're referring to. And I am sure it is based more on conjecture or yeah. guesswork than yeah. on any statistics. Not no specific statistics. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I would not want to believe in that proposition. Okay. Uh, you know, and you would understand. But do you think that my political opponents would come and say, thumbs up, SR, you did the best TRRC in the world? No, they would not say that. But I am satisfied with the fact that in a more enlightened circles, they hailing our TRRC as the best ever. Yeah. That is a fact. But my political opponents would not say that because by saying that they are in fact endorsing me. That's so it would appear to a lot of people. So they would not say that. It is politics. I have the courage to commend my colleagues or my opponents in things that they have done. Yesterday I did say that Ba Useinu performed his functions as Gambia's top diplomat with distinction. I have no problem saying that. But my political opponents would hardly. Well, before I was a candidate, I was a superstar lawyer. Yes. I did marvelous. I performed my job with distinction. Well, welcome oh, this to politics. guy is amazing. Well, welcome where to where politics. Is this? OK. Welcome so now, to politics. therefore, we have to understand this as just some political gymnastics. It would not yield them any results. We would win the election come December 4th. Come December 4th. And then when you win December 4th, uh, what happens to the TRRC report? Yesterday I watched you say you're committed to implementing the report. But you you were the, you were the how do you call it? You, 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 George you, now you become the joy jury and the executive. How, does, no, how are you no. going to handle that? Okay, put it this way. Put it this way. Mm -hmm. I was the lead counsel. Some misconstrued my position as the prosecutor. Excuse me. But my role was there to help ensure justice. Yeah. While there, I have received false evidence against Jame. I rejected it. Because I had an obligation to be fair to Jame like I, was, like I would be fair to anybody else. I was not against any particular individual. Some people, you know, in politics, you just smear the other person. You know, you twist things and smear the other person. But I was most fair to everybody. People saw how I dealt with Yankuba Ture. I was most fair to him, even though I believed that he committed serious crime. I was most fair to Edward Singate, even though I believed he committed serious crimes. And that is who I was. I was a fair person, only interested in justice. You understand? So even if I become president, my responsibility would be to ensure justice and also to uphold the Constitution. Is there any conflict of interest? There is, in fact, a convergence of interest. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, leave that, I'll leave that to my viewers. I'll leave that to my viewers to, to make a judgment but, on that. But you see, you see, you see, uh, one has to realize that my political opponents would not now, at this stage, 
come to support me. They would try to look for things. Many of them would look for things that would enable them to score political points against me. And this is what this is all about. I know that in our interpersonal relationships, they would be telling me, oh, you did a fantastic job. But of course, like one of them would tell me, oh, Mr. Val, you know, I'm not your enemy, but when I'm out there, it is politics. I have to say bad things about you. And I accept it. That is the politics we have in this country. Um, if at that level is even a little more understanding than the mod slinging, uh, I promise here that I would never be involved in mod slinging. Uh, one thing that is always a constant with me, it's respect for the other person. You know, treat them with respect and dignity. Okay, we all do have our moments of, you know, when you cross the line, mm -hmm. simply because for me, it has to be serious injustice and things like that. But otherwise, I'm a, I like respect for everybody else. Do things properly, you know, so. But now I want to look at the policies that you bring to the table. Um, I, I watched you last night and I heard some interesting things, but I want to be specific. Um, what is going to be your policy when it comes to the economy? when it comes to education, when it comes to health care. And well, you have to take them one at a time. Let's talk about <laughs> health care first. Yes. Health care. Uh, you see, health care is very expensive. And in Gambia, we do not have a lot of money yeah. indicated. So not too much money or not enough money is available for health care. Well, if you ask me, I think our, our process or in, in allocating resources, we do not place the right priority on things like healthcare and education. Just look at the budgetary allocation of $600 million for Office of the President. It beats me what they're busy buying with that kind of money. You see, I would have expected that a whole chunk of that money could have been moved to health care and education. Or even provision of certain services for the people, like water. Water is a big problem in this country. It's a lot of the places. You know? So why can't we use that money? Say, take 100 million of that. How many boreholes can you get out of that? You know, so, so I believe it's misplaced priority. But how would I deal with the issue of health care? Yeah. You have too many problems in our health care sector. One is lack of facilities. The other is lack of the requisite kind of specialized training. And training for the care that our sick people need. So you have to find solutions for each of those three. And the first one is the facilities. We have to invest in these facilities. You go to some hospitals, they are not as clean as they should be. A hospital should be clean. You must have enough beds. But let's look at the basic facilities that take, for instance, women need. Yeah. There is no mammogram machine in this country. Is that a good thing? Exactly. So basic, basic facilities are lacking. Well, I explained the story about my dad yesterday. There is no ICU, ICU facility at Serakunda Hospital. That is a serious problem. So one has to invest in facilities to help improve our health care. How do you do that? Is you try to save money from other things. I mean, a government has to always find ways to expand the cake. So the government ex invest in things that would help it generate more revenue. 
or that would help invite or bring in other players to provide services in that area. All right? So we have to help expand the cake in order to be able to make savings to invest in, in health facilities. So you have to invest in the facilities, have to invest in training yeah. of people to have the specialized skills needed and train people on the care, how to take good care of patients. But all that aside, we know that it's not likely that the government would ever have enough money to do that. See, but, but development does not come through a one-way street. That is why, you, you know, there are other sectors like the private sector can also come in. But in this case, why can't we have a system of health insurance wherein we, the people, contribute to our own health care? Just imagine, just imagine if we say, okay, any Gambian above five years should contribute $200 in. I know not everybody would pay. Yeah. But the greater part of the population with good enforcement mechanisms could be made to pay. But already the poverty level in this country is, is, is what, 45%? Yes. How, uh, no, yes. 70 something percent. Yes. How are we able to, we're, we're difficult, we're having issues even having two me meals look, a day. Look, How is that look, going to be effective? Look, it's $200, okay? And I gave that number randomly. Okay. We could stagger it if your income for the year is less than 5000 you pay $50 a year. If your income is up to 10000 for the year, you pay 100 If your income is like that of Fatu Ture, $100,000 a month, you pay 5000 You pay as you earn. With that money, can't we be able to supplement what government has provided for health care and provide better health care for the people, I think it's a no-brainer. And that would be your solution for, for the health care problem. Um, with, with, with our debt level right now... Um, but this is no debt. No, no, I'm talking about... Um, I know you, you, coming to the agriculture, with our debt level right now, um, something that our grand, great-grandchildren will be paying, how would you... Um, change the agricultural sector to make it lucrative for the ordinary farmer. Okay, you see, this too is, look, the government would not have to go into farming. No. Okay. What governments do is to facilitate, help create an environment which would make doing business in a particular area easier and to give it the possibility of greater success. You understand? So, even though the investments the government would make in the area may have a little bit of an impact on debt, but there are certain things that it's not just money. It's organization, good organization, and seriousness and dedication. That's what it takes sometimes. Just imagine if the government would fix the land tenure system in particular areas and provide certain basic inputs. Like it. you take a land, piece of land, you provide the basic facilities. Say, Gunyur, you know the Chinese are fighting uh, with the locals for the narcos. Yeah. Uh, you, well, it's a terrible situation. We must make sure that this thing ends. Uh, but if you take land where the women would farm and government would put in the basic inputs and give it to the women to farm and government would provide actual extension officers to be giving them regular advice and guidance and doing supervisory work, working with them on their farms. And they grow their produce and government would help them market through internet, through whatever services available, help them provide uh, 
transport the, their produce to where they are needed, and the government would charge a little fee for their cost. Wouldn't that help boost agricultural production? We had a beautiful plan here, like the Jahali Pachar. Yeah. It was adopted by Senegal, and it's working very well in Senegal. We could reintroduce that here. But you see, sometimes the problem here is the corruption and the selfishness of people that make certain, products, certain projects not to work. But that too is a failure of leadership. If you have good leadership, you can ensure that these things don't happen. And we can do it. It's just having the right people in the right place. But um, specifically, when you talk about agriculture, still on agriculture, uh, when you look at um, farmers, um, they, agriculture should be mechanized now. Uh, the local way of doing things are not, you know, because they cannot be competing if they are doing things well, but the local the ways is, until now. Our agriculture is still very subsistence. Yeah. And government should promote agribusiness mm -hmm. and try to help provide some of the facilities that would enable farmers to, to farm uh, uh, 12 months in the year. Now, farming here is basically seasonal. seasonal. Uh, we should also help farmers invest in perennial crops instead of these uh, uh, seasonal crops. I mean, that, uh, these, these are things that can be done to help improve our agriculture. You know? But just look at the difference. A Gambian farm and Radville farm. Radville would succeed, the Gambian farm would fail. Because Radville has the financial muscles, they have the equipment, they have the training, they have the support. All that, all that is true. But remember, when you went to, when you go to Jahali Pacha Pacha. and all these, yeah. government had provided all these things. It's all about management and leadership. I, I'm not saying that there are no other problems, yeah. but I'm saying that the failure of management, the failure of leadership accounts for a great part why these government projects failed, as opposed to these private projects. Uh, let me give you an example. I had a farm, a cashew farm. It failed for one thing. You know what? We paid somebody to do the fire belt. I was away. The person, we called him, he said, yes, he's done the fire belt. The person didn't. The farm perished. This is our situation. People don't do what they're supposed to do. Just imagine how much was lost just simply because one person failed to do what he was required to do. If that person had done the right thing, that Kasi farm may probably be still be in existence and would benefit him. So a lot has to change in this country. Ah. So if I give work to a Gambian and you have a Caucasian here give the same work to that person, maybe it's more likely that that of the Caucasian would be done better than mine. We have to change that mindset. Is it, that is more of our attitudes, attitudinal change. It has to happen. And it brings me to the, yeah, the leadership you're talking about, um, the, ci the civil service reforms that we have yearned for um, in 2016. Uh, it hasn't happened. We want to change. <laughs> it hasn't happened. But a lot of people will say, these politicians will tell you, we will do this. But when it comes to actually doing it, because when you talk about civil service reforms, it's more about taking the right people in places and those that are not uh, doing well. It depends on change. how it is done. It depends on what would what would an SFL government do to give Gambia the civil service that we enjoyed during Jawara's time, or um, even better. Uh, you see, we don't even have to look too far away mm -hmm. for an example on how to do this. Yeah. Uh, you remember, Gambia had a civil service reform program in which we did some redundancy. Yeah. So that is one good example of how to do it, what we can do with that and how to do it. But let me tell you of my own personal plan. Mm -hmm. uh, my plan is every job has to be matched with the right person, both in terms of integrity, academic qualification, and experience. 
So the first thing you would have to do is to audit the system to know what it is that you have and what is deficient. That's the first thing one would do. Uh, uh, I mean, it's difficult to tell a person, a family man, that you are going to lose your job. Yeah. And it is also cruel. It's not that person's fault that he or she is employed there. You understand? So we have to do something and do things properly. The first thing I would do is to establish a civil service academy where everybody is trained on a system of government. How government would do things, how government would work. A lot of the people are in government, they don't know how government functions. It is important that everybody has one common understanding on how government functions. What are the individual roles and responsibilities and how they are to be performed. To have a civil service academy to teach people and ensure that civil servants are sent for training in this civil service academy. And you, stay, you stagger them. You cannot send all of them together, otherwise there won't be anybody doing government work. You stagger them in batches. And those that go for training, for a petty, for petty, you divide civil service into cadres that are already, like it is already the case. You have junior officers, you have, uh, well, you have uh, juniors, you have uh, junior officers, then senior officers of the permanent secretary and so forth. So for each cadre, you have specially designed courses for them. And they do the training. Afterwards, they take exams. Everybody has to pass to retain their jobs. If the person does not pass, you don't just jettison the person like that. You retrain them into something they, that they would do better and try to move them there. Those who would prefer something else, you give them a redundancy package and train them into whatever it is that they want to do in the future. That is the way to do it. So it wouldn't be painful to those people who, who are affected. In fact, they would have a buy-in to that, pro buy in, into that program simply because it also take, takes into account what their needs are. That is the way you do the reform. So by the time you finish with each cadre, you would have very highly skilled and competent people to mind the areas in which they are employed. And for each one of them, you have a career path. It's not like you have grade nine and you become director general. We cannot have that in the system. That is why the system is failing. You don't even have O levels. You are a director somewhere. These things must end. How do we expect to develop a country with such caliber people? We're fooling ourselves if we think we can. But this is the way to do a good civil service reform. So let's talk about the education. What's your plan for the education sector? You know, you know, in Gambia, we are part of a block. Mm -hmm. That is West African Exams Council block. Yeah. And uh, it determines the, the school curriculum and the type of education we offer. I do believe that up to a certain level, as a country, we should determine what it is that we need and we provide training to our students in those things that we need. Because the whole essence of education is to be able to solve problems. Yeah. But if we train people into things that would not help us solve our problems, we are providing useless training. If you go to the university now, they are training so many law students, yeah. so many history students, so many literature students and arts, or what have you. Is that really what we need for Gambia's development? We're not training based on our needs. Exactly. Yeah. So we should reorient our education to train people in what we need. We should have polytechnics. I, I heard that GTTI was being transferred transform into a university. I was disappointed. What we need are not universities at this time, 
What we need are technical schools, vocational schools and colleges. If you look at it in Gambia, most of the carpenters are now Senegalese. The tailors are obviously oh. Senegalese. Mm -hmm. The bakers are either Guineans or Senegalese. What else? Fishermen. Uh, fishermen are mm -hmm. all Senegalese. The electricians, well, I have never used the Senegalese. But the painters are all Senegalese. So where are the Gambians? You see, it is not the fault, absolute, complete fault of the youths to sit just at home and drink attire and so forth. A lot of them lack opportunities. And what opportunities would you create for these? First is create things for them to do meaningful engagement, be it sports, be it vocational training, be it further education. These are things that the government should invest in. All right? Uh, yesterday I said, I talked about why it is that the, is it that the young persons go on the parkway. Because if you don't have anything to do here, you go on the parkway. A friend of mine once told me that the boys in Germany told him that, well, if they receive, say, 600 euros sitting in a refugee camp in Germany, they can contribute, say, about 100 euros for food within the camp, keep 100 euros, and still send 400 euros to their families in Gambia. And that would be more than they would have earned being in Gambia. That encourages a lot of them to want to take the back way to go and even just sit at language in a refugee camp in Germany. Yeah. You see? So what we must do is invest on things that can help the youths out of their malice. We should invest in sports, but more importantly, we should invest in skills. If, you know, as a child in Banjul, there was a vocational school. The vocational school, they were paid a stipend. That encourages them to go into the school. And they are taught auto mechanics. They are taught, uh, trained to be electricians. They are trained to be carpenters. But they were not just trained and just let out like that. They could go on attachment to Gambia Public Works. At the time, that department was doing a lot of government work. So the carpenters would have work to do, the electricians, and the masoners would all have work to do. But now, there's no vocational school. What we have is on the GTTI. But there is also no public works to do government contracts. So even if these people were trained, you don't have anywhere to absorb them. To, to absorb them. So that is a problem. These are the things the government could invest in. It would help. It would help create employment. But it would also help create training. And there should be a system of certification. A system of certification uh, for people who would be engaged in that profession. If, say, for instance, we say that to work as a mechanic in Gambia, you must have a basic mechanic certificate. Yeah. All of them would go and try to get the certificate. You see, for those who are already mechanics, you do tests that would qualify you. For those who want to learn to be mechanics, you have to go to the vocational school. So if we say, if we make it a law that to work in this field, you must have a certain quality, a certain standard, and we have bureaus that would serve as inspectorate bureaus, then everybody would want to get the training or the certification. And that way, you create a cadre of professionals, of skilled people in particular areas. But here is a free for all. We have to train people in the right skills, ensure that they are also protected. Because there is no point going to school, paying all that money, and then you finish. And the profession that you learn is a free for all. And that is why today, if you take a Gambian kid and say, I want to train you to a mechanic, the person would hardly wait to know everything that he should know. After, a, after six months, one year, he already claims he's a mechanic. Off he goes to set up his own garage. That is what happens here. We have to be honest about these things. You know? 
because there is no system of certification. That is why. If there was a system, they would have all stayed to be qualified because they know that there is no way they could go out there and pretend that they are mechanics if they don't have the certificate. Here, it is so bad that even for the regulated professions, we have quacks and charlatans walking around. If you go in the provinces, you have people carrying briefcases pretending to be doctors. So these are things that we have to police and protect. But for the, purpose, for the trades, we have to do something about it. But unfortunately, okay. there is no regulation. So let's talk about still on youth affairs. I know that a lot of the young people, you talk about um, carpenters, masons, and other professions that young people are engaged in. But most of the time, the reason why uh, young entrepreneurs failed in their business is because they don't have the financial muscles. In Gambia, before you can set up any business uh, or trying to even um, to, to uh, upgrade your business, you want some, some financial support and you only turn to the banks. And the first thing they ask is for collateral. And how many of us can put a leased property at the bank? Uh, what role should government play to help these young entrepreneurs, especially the young ones that are just growing and trying to um, excel in their trade? Uh, yes, uh, I think government should make access to finance to the youth a whole lot easier than it is. Registration of businesses should be streamlined. I know that there's work that's been done in this country about that. But hey, in Rwanda nowadays, you can register a business online. Why can't we do things like that? Reduce the bureaucracy, streamline it, and make it easy. With regards to access to finance, you see, we have excluded the greater bulk of, 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 uh, uh, of assets in this country from being qualified to be used as collateral. A lot of the, say, real estate in this country is held in customary tenure. Mm -hmm. You cannot use that as mortgage yeah. in the bank. No. So already, for a lot of the people in the country, you have excluded yeah. them from having any possibility yeah. of having access. access to finance using, using, using the, uh, the, the lands uh, that, 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 that they have. So we have to fix the land tenure system in order to be able to use that. Because what you have, therefore, is dead capital. You have a lot of capital, but you cannot use it. It is dead capital. So we have to breathe new life into that, resuscitate it, for it to be use, usable. We cannot do that if we do not change the land tenure system. And that is, that is one. Another thing that government can do to create access to finance is like, you know, we did have an agricultural bank before. Yeah. Okay? So government has to put in the seed money, you know, for the bank to be able to function, to give out loans for agricultural purposes. That can, something like that can be done again. Youth, youth venture finance corporations, something like that. Youth enterprises. Or youth enterprises, but oh. you want to show yeah. that it's the finance. Financing, okay. That's right. So we can have a public-private partnership. I mean, there's a lot of money in the diaspora. But Gambians can't invest in here. What, what, what can Gambians invest in here? It has to be an individual personal business. We don't form companies. Yes. We don't. Because the thing is, we don't work together. And that is why I said, if I am fortunate to be elected, I'm honored and privileged to be elected, by the Gambian people, I will set up an office, the Diaspora Assistance, mm -hmm. Diaspora Affairs Office within the office of the president to help people in the diaspora invest in Gambia. Just imagine if we should form that youth enterprise, which serves as a bank that gives loans to youths. But you, you give them loans, but you assist them in the process. You see, Ablai Wad did something really dramatic in Senegal when he took over. He gathered a lot of Senegalese businesses and said, look, a lot of these things in this country are dominated by foreigners. We would take government money and give it to you. If you fail, you pay it back as incentive to help them to, to fight 
to get into the business in that particular area yeah. with a view to rest, uh, removing control and domination from, 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 from the hands of foreigners. Right. And a lot of these Senegalese did well. It's because of government incentive. We can create a scheme here where we give you loans and provide you advice and gui guidance, like, just like Tango, you, uh, this, this, this IBAS used to do, that is Indigenous Business Advisory Services, something like that. But the thing is, you just put in smart ways of carrots and sticks, incentives and punishments. If they do well, they pay less. Understand? And if they don't do well, they repay the loan. You know, it's just re you're just reversing potential. So that so would serve as great incentive for them to do well. So you're trying to encourage success and so forth. But these things are doable. Uh, a lot of these things have been tried in this country before, like IBAS and so forth. The reason why they fail is not that the policies are not good. Coming up with policies can be easy. easy. Coming up with policies can be easy. I can sit here and literally on every area you throw at me, I can just come up with what can fly, you know, what can pass. But policies don't implement themselves. It's just like constitutions. They don't implement themselves. In the 70s, the Soviet Union had one of the better constitutions in the world. But it was one of the worst places to live in because of the, it had almost a dictatorship. You see, at least by my standards. Some other people would disagree. This is all about leadership and the quality and caliber and commitment of the people entrusted with the responsibility to implement these policies. No matter how good policies you have, yeah. if, we, if you have the wrong people to implement them, they would fail woefully. And that is why I said yesterday that a lot of the policies I outlined, my opponents would outline similar policies. But the difference between them and I is that I believe that I have the commitment, the stamina, and, and the experience and the capability to ensure that I would provide that leadership that would ensure success in a lot of the things that we do. And that is why there's this difference. So I still want to come back to this, uh, the current status of the country. Uh, when COVID hit across the world, every economy was hit hard. Gambia is no exception. Um, how would you rate the government's response to COVID-19? Excuse me, let me take some water. Is that let bad? Let me just kill it down. Is it that bad? <laughs> Dismal. Ah. Dismal. Hmm. It's no bragging, it's no exaggeration. At a much lower scale, we delivered food aid to the people of the country. Mm -hmm. Whose initiative was it to deliver food aid? It was us. Government only followed later. Yeah. They even blamed me and suggested that I, I was working with Alaji Hussein Udabo instead of working with Adam Abara. We did not care. Actually, we invited all of them to work with us as this was an emergency. None of them responded to us. They all copied what we were doing. They copied. They played playing catch-up. And we did the most efficient delivery. In fact, some places we went, the Alcalos were saying, ah, man sakunda la, la mano felele, muma mano. We come and we deliver, we distribute, and the people are happy they receive their food, they go. So there are things that the government did right. There are things the government did right. But you saw, you know, <laughs> for me, <laughs> They put the cart before the horse. How? In s the first reaction was they closed the schools. Yeah. But they left the border open. <laughs> and the Senegalese were coming in. Yeah. That was a fundamental mistake. Because in, in a situation of infectious diseases of this nature, you want to protect your borders. If they don't come in with it, it won't exist here. And look at what used to happen in the airport. 
a big failure, massive failure of security. People will come and dodge. And then the corruption in the system did not help us because people who were taken for quarantine were able to pay their way out. Who do you blame? How would you rate that performance? What do you think of the security sector reform, the ongoing security sector reform? I saw you yesterday talked about the situation, the, the security situation of the country. How would you access the ongoing uh, security sector? How would I assess it? Well, I don't know exactly what it is that they have done. Uh, but uh, uh, I do think that we have an overbloated army. I think that the, the ranks are just too exaggerated. With this small army, how many generals do we have? Uh, you have an army of Lieutenant Connells who really don't have the requisite qualification to attain those standards, those, the, those ranks in other armies. But it's not their fault. And one thing I must say, though, is that we have one of the better armies in the sub-region. Gambian soldiers perform very well in UN peacekeeping missions, and we have to commend them. We have to commend them. And during the impasse, the army and Gambian army stayed put. They did not do anything. They could have been used to do terrible things, but they did not. So we have to commend them. But nonetheless, we have to reform the army. I would think that the army themselves would want to be a, an army that is useful instead of an army that just sits there and dance every morning and not do much. You know, they could be more involved in national development. Like they could help in floods. They could be trained to deal with those, to help in national emergencies. They could be, they could be trained to provide certain services, public services, like you have an army engineering corps to be building roads. You, you have an army uh, corps of builders to be mm -hmm. building public schools and uh, public buildings and so on. We could use our army much better. So now what we do is just we just waste money and feed an army. That is it, literally. So uh, that is one important area of reform that we must have. There are other areas of reform, but I don't want to preempt the TRRC but, but, report. Yeah, so I, I would not want to say much, much more, more about security sector reform. But what, what like the, the general uh, feeling in this in the, in the street is um, a lot of um, thieves around, people breaking into people's houses and properties. What do you think government needs to do right now to help secure us at homes? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of security intervention measures that could be put in place. Mm -hmm. uh, but first of all, they need to have data. If our police does not collect data, then it is problematic. Yeah. You see, information helps you crystallize the problem. And once the problem is crystallized, you'd be able to find remedial measures. So there needs to be data. You can't base your, your, your hypothesis on guesswork. It has to be based on cogent information, empirical information. So once we have the information as to the crime rates, where they happen and the types of crimes, then we are able to make better and informed intervention. Say, for instance, if the problem is in the TDA area, you can have cameras and you deploy more police in those areas. But deploy also police that you know they can't be easily corrupted. Because, you know, here the police would arrest somebody, you give a few arches, and then you let go. So we have to deal with those issues. So if the problem is, say, in, in, in the residential areas, you can do community policing. And that helps a great deal, you see, and have a system of wardens. You know, in every area, you have a warden who is responsible for knowing what is going around. And they have access to call numbers, you know, and you zone the various areas and ensure that you have a security of related office there, huh? be it an anti-crime office or, or, or a police station. 
which covers a particular area. You know, that way you are able to reduce crime. Because crime, crime festers where there is no enforcement, when there is no law and order enforcement. But, but, but if once you have that, it reduces. So I think that is what is needed. Just go past uh, this place. Uh, what's the name of the place? Kolo Litavan area. It's like there are no police in the Gambia. Yeah. Drugs are being dealt just like that. Uh, you see the people you know <laughs> that this is not normal. But hey, it's like there's an absence of drug enforcement in this country. So, and, and that is why the security situation has degenerated, has deteriorated. Uh, but we need to invest in those areas. There needs to be more police presence, you know, in these areas in order to be able to bring down the, 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 the crime rate. In some instances, it may even be necessary to deploy paramilitary, but unarmed at least, just to, you know. So, few months, um, I think it's over 200 days since you know, it was announced there was a seizure of tons of drugs at the seaport. Up to now, um, we have not got any major update on that. And the Gambia, uh, small Gambia, um, how do you think something like this would turn it, uh, would, how would our image be looked at when a country like Gambia is being um, looked at as a, a transit for drugs? And do you think it affects us internationally that much? Uh, maybe that's a question for the president. <laughs> I am not yet on that seat. <laughs> but but, but, you, but you, you are seeking to that uh, office. Uh, yes, <laughs> so that was just a joke. Yeah. I think I think some a lot of people have to answer yeah. to that question. But certainly, uh, it's a reputational problem, yeah. and uh, it's not good for the country. It's not good for the country at all to be labelled a narco country a drug country, because it has a lot of serious implications, uh, you know. But it is my belief that, say, the National Assembly should have asked questions about this drug issue. Where are these drugs? What happened to them? I am not aware of any such questions being asked. Uh, and uh, there is talk around town. I do believe, I want to believe, I sincerely hope that my belief is true that our government would have the interest of the Gambian people and that our government would not be involved in doing things that would allow drugs to go into the streets of this country. I do believe that we have, no matter what one says, that our government would not be so irresponsible as to allow that. But I don't know what has happened. But whatever it is, they have to answer to these questions, you know. But to answer the question you have asked me, it would be a terrible disaster if those drugs were to find their way into the Gambian streets. Already we know that there is a lot of drugs in this country. You name it. From cocaine to heroin to ecstasy and others that I don't know. And it is the responsibility of the government to ensure that they really enforce the drug law on this country. Uh, I visited the prisons on several occasions. Even when COVID broke out, I was the one to go to the prison and supply them with the things that would protect them, hand sanitizers, uh, the buckets and the, and the uh, detergents that, you know, I did that for the prison. And you know what? The, what you find there are quite a lot of young boys convicted on one joint of marijuana. Can you imagine? They catch you with one joint of marijuana, sentence you for five years, and we feed the person for five years for one joint of marijuana. Can you imagine? So we have to even re-examine the sentencing policies of the judiciary. Because it is terrible 
that you have a child of seven, a young person of 17 years old yeah. to go and languish in jail for five, five years, years for one joint, joint. of marijuana. Uh -huh. A not so hard drug that is being legalized all over the world. And we are tr still trapped in, in our old ways. I'm not saying that we should just liberalize just like that. But we have to be reasonable in the way we do certain things. So that is an area that needs re-examination. But generally, the drugs, hard drugs are a problem now in this country. Instead of, instead of chasing after young boys with one joint of cannabis, I think they should descend on the ecstasy, the heroin, and the cocaine market in this country. That is where the problem is. Very Any deep president problems. who can solve the electrical problem is doing us a lot of good. Well, if because elected... Because even, in, even in, 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 in investors... If elected in office, my team would solve that problem. Because, look, we do, we do all acknowledge that we have a very old grid. We cannot produce enough. All right? Why don't we invest in renewable energy? We have a sun that gives us a lot of energy. Why can't we in, in invest in solar? Wow. Why? Wow. Exactly. So if elected in office, we have a plan yeah. where we set up a company for Gambians to buy shares in, and we invest in renewable energy. And that would reduce, if not solve, the, 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 the energy crisis of this country. We don't produce enough. Even that what is produced, goes, a lot of it goes to waste because of the leakages, because of the, bar, the old grid that we have. So we have, to, we have to, look, you do something for years and it keeps failing and we still continue doing it the same way. Yeah. Something is fundamentally wrong. We have to change course. That's why we offer a turnaround. A turnaround from the normal way of doing things, business as usual, which is ensuring failure. We want to change things. We want to turn things around. We want to change the way we do things and therefore change the results. And we also want to ensure that we have the right type of leadership that that can deliver on these promises, and not just the same type of leadership that would ensure failure. This is why we are going into the politics. We need a turnaround. We need a turnaround. Otherwise, we would keep hitting the wall, and we make no progress, and we keep failing our people. We have to do something about it. For once, let us look to young, dynamic, educated, enlightened, and accomplished leadership. And that would be me. And that would be you. How yes. connected are you to the grassroots, Esther? Politics is not okay. A, how you connected know what? are I you am, to the grassroots? My team is going to win. And we cannot win without the grassroots. Yeah. And my belief is that we are connected to the grassroots. Look, I am not the person many people will think I am, especially for those who don't know me. I am the most accessible person in this country. Nobody would tell you that I have called Esar Fall and he did not pick up. Nobody would tell you that I have messaged Esar Fall and he didn't respond. If that happens, I probably did not see the call or did not see the message. If you go to my house, people come in and out every time. I have no gatekeeper. I have no police walking with me, preventing people from talking to me. Of course, I'm a man of the people. I am connected to the people. So anywhere in the country, everywhere, you name it, when I pass, everybody will recognize me. And I do not put a barrier between myself and the people. Market vendors will call me and I will pick up and give them the same attention that I would give the banker. That is me. 
and I would not change that. But why didn't you join any of the existing parties we have? We have, we have over 10 political parties. You want to tell me you don't have similar policies and plans? Is it about the Fankun Fankun you spoke about yesterday? It's no. about you, the leadership. No, no. And why do you have to have your own candidacy? Could you not have joined a party and police influence your policies into that party, inject your ideas and policies into that party? You see, it's, for me, it's all about leadership. Okay. I believe that Gambia has to be given the best there is to offer. Uh, if I could have taken somebody I believe it's best and bring that person and get the person to do it, then maybe I would. Okay. But why not me if I believe that I can do a better job yeah. than what is available? And that is my drive. I have a commitment, a very deep-seated commitment to help solve the plight of the Gambian people. I I mean, I believe I would be better at doing it from what is available. And that is why I am doing it. I could have been doing other things, and I could be equally happy with it. In fact, I'd have more freedom doing it. But not that I have any negative views about any of the parties. I mean, a lot of them may have brilliant policies. A lot of them have brilliant candidates. I have met some of them in several fora. A lot of them are very smart. All right? I just believe that I would make a better leader. If I didn't, I wouldn't be running. Why not a party? Why not a party? Yes. You see, being an independent candidate comes with certain benefits. I want the freedom to be able to select the best and brightest to come, and, to come and take over uh, responsibility for this country. I don't want to, to have to select from a bunch of people who are given to me, uh, party bigwigs who are probably not qualified for certain positions. I don't want to be beholden to anybody. I want to have that absolute freedom to sit down and say, I would choose 50% Gambian women to be in the cabinet and choose those Gambian women I believe are very educated, have great principles and great values to come and bring their knowledge, expertise and experience to the governance of this country. I want to be able to look to the diaspora and say, I'll take about 40% of my cabinet from the diaspora without having to kowtow or respond or deliver to the wishes of a party secretary somewhere or a coalition member somewhere who would compel me by reason of prior arrangements to select particular individuals. I want that freedom and that's why I am going independent. If I could have another arrangement which would not shackle me or will, will not shackle the leader and I am also convinced that the leader would be able to deliver to, the, to my expectations. And that I am convinced that the process of selecting that person is beyond reproach. Of course, I will go along with it. But until I have that, I will continue on this journey. Is ESA open to any uh, alliance before of course, elections? Of course, I am open to. I am open to alliances. Already, I have promises of endorsement from wow. several groups. I am hoping that other political parties would come and endorse my candidacy. There is also a possibility of coalitions because it makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, you know, but I will not go into a coalition with anybody just for the sake of going into a coalition. I don't want a coalition of very strange bedfellows. I don't want a coalition that would fail even before it takes off. I want a coalition of like minds, a coalition of people who can work together. I want a coalition of people who would have, who would bring people of the requisite 
capabilities to run this country. Otherwise, it would be business as usual. Yes, so if we have a coalition, say, for instance, of several parties, we win. And then we have a head of state of similar character to the one we try to remove. And then we have a government similar to the one we try to remove. It's just old wine in new bottle. New bottle. And that would, be, that would have been a big waste, at least for me. And that is what I don't want. And that is why I am running. Because I am certain that with me at the helm, it would not be business as usual. Things would change. We would turn things around. That is the promise I am giving to the Gambian people. And finally, this is the most difficult question for every politician. What is a SFL government's position on LGBT rights? Uh, look, uh, you see, we are trying to create a storm in a teacup. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. LGBTI or LGBTQI is not a Gambian problem. It is not. And let's be honest. We had ways of dealing with these things in our society and let sleeping dogs lie. You see, it's because we are drumming these things up, it becomes a problem. It's just like this issue of the secular provision in the Constitution. Whether to put in the word secular or not to put it, generated so much debate that was absolutely unnecessary. Because what A is asking for is already provided. Esther is already a politician. No, I'm not. You're already deflecting my question. No, You're I'm not just... telling me anything specific about no, what I'm you just... will do. Are you going I, to look, allow them I, and to... And I told you <laughs> that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay. If it ain't broke, don't fix, fix it. it. It's not a big problem in this country. It's not. So why make a meal out of it. It's not. Mm -hmm. Let sleeping dogs lie. Look, certain things are better left untouched. And you open a Pandora's box, it becomes a problem. You know, and it's not necessary for it to be made a problem. You know, Gambia has not reached that stage, and I don't think it would ever reach that stage because of the culture and religion of our people. And we have to respect that. That is absolutely important. You know, even on the laws of this country, our own sense of morality would trump everything. So, so that's why I say it's not a problem. It's not a Gambian problem. It's not a Gambian problem. And what's your final message to the Gambians? Why should we? You have said so many things why we should vote you in. We need a turnaround. But what's your final message to the Gambian people? My final message is I don't believe that Gambians would take this as business as usual, that they would do things as they used to do before, that parochial values would inform how they choose their leaders. I think the situation is so bad in this country that people would reflect on how to choose their leaders. And I do believe that it is about time that they choose knowledge over ignorance, they choose integrity over dishonesty, and they choose experience over neophytes, and they would also choose good leadership, you know, Accomplished leadership, experienced leadership over what we have now. And, and once we do that, we would see that things would start to turn around. We have for the longest time ceded the political arena to those I believe are not the best and the brightest that our country can produce. I'm, you see, I'm not saying that absolutely education or degree holders are the best. No. We have to look at the person holistically. Education is absolutely important. 
you don't necessarily have to be a professor. You understand? But at least you should have something to show. But people will say most of some of the um, great leaders in, in West Africa, let's say, um, let's say in, in, in uh, Paul Kagame, is not one of the best educated people, but he's torn his country uh, to where an example that everybody look at. Look uh, at uh, Robert Mugabe. Le, 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 Mugabe. Mugabe is educated, but look at what he has torn his country into. Uh, look, that is another okay, conversation. Look, look, Mugabe got things wrong yeah. at the time he started growing senile. You know, Mugabe died at 90 something. Yeah. Uh, you see? Mm. But Mugabe, at his best, was a superstar, and we all know it. Paul Kagame is not stupid, and Paul Kagame is educated. And not only that, Paul Kagame, the most brilliant move he made when he took over was he put, he brought his people. Look, the first war has ended. The second war is now going to start. Those who fought the first war are not necessarily those who are going to fight the next war. And he, thank you for your service. You have done well as soldiers. You have fought for Rwanda. Now we have to get the best and the brightest Rwanda can produce to come and rule this country. That's what he did. And that's what turned Rwanda around. And that's what I want to do in this country. Candidate SFR, thank you very much for this extensive and long detailed interview. I'm sure a lot of Gambians will get to know more about your programs and ideas, and we look forward to having you more here on Kirfatu. It's always a pleasure to have you. I Mr. hope I hope next time in a completely different capacity. In a, can thank you, you very can much. Can you promise to be to give us the first interview if elected <laughs> into government? Into, I, I mean, I'm asking. I can't make I'm that asking promise. I'm asking in front I, of everybody. Uh, you, you seem to enjoy these interviews. Yes. I, I can't make that promise yet, but be rest assured uh, that if I am honored and privileged to be elected, I will be as accessible to the media as possible. Uh, you see, the problems of many problems in Africa is due to lack of transparency. When was the last time the president addressed the press in this country? Long time ago. Exactly. And you have a lot of questions to ask. Actually, actually, I, I was among the first people who interviewed the president twice in the first year. And since then, I have read tons of letters and I still cannot have. I'm looking forward to having That's why. him and, here and, and, or and, and these house. things should, in fact, be made mandatory. The president should face the press and answer the questions of concern to the Gambian people. Why is the president not making himself available to the press? Do they have anything to hide? Do they have anything to hide? Mr. President, do you have anything to hide, as I is asking? I did not say that. You just <laughs> asked the question. This is going to be an interesting I asked question. you that question. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting political season. And we look forward to seeing you on the campaign trail. Thank uh, you. To see a different side of you. It's going to be interesting to see you uh, on the campaign No, you would not see a different side I of mean, me. from the, from, from the, you know, what we're used to is seeing you, uh, the TRRC, that setup, and now seeing you on a campaign trail, that will be interesting. And it would be the same person. Same SFR. Always polite, yeah. always focused on the issues, and always committed to helping the Gambian people. And that's me. That's what I do on a daily basis from sunrise to sunset. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we, like I said, we look forward to seeing you on the campaign trail. And to you all, good night to you all. I hope you enjoy. Good night to you all. See you another time. Bye-bye. Are you thinking of owning your dream homes? EJ Investment is here for you. Secure our quality bungalows with two, three, or four bedrooms. Or our story building, three or four to five bedrooms at very affordable prices with flexible payment plans. At our Sanyang Seaview Estate, where you can enjoy the cool breeze with modern infrastructure.
such as the roads, covered drainage system, modern electrification with street lights, gated entrance with security posts, and social amenities such as gas station, shopping mall, medical clinic, park, schools, children daycare, and a lot more. Our dedicated team of professionals will keep the estate clean at all times, provide security and patrol team within the estate premises, install latest technologies such as CCTV, Wi-Fi, home network installation, solar panel, and power backup system. Also, check out for our additional home facilities and interior design service, such as premium tiling, wall plaster, home landscape, fingerprint home lock, and a lot more. Visit our office at Senegambia Kololi Highway and get a free site visit tour or contact us on 4464-838. WhatsApp us on 3259-220 or you can visit our Facebook page or Instagram on EJ Investments. EJ Investments, we are first in properties. Fay lempo waru gala si kepo ko hamne do mi reo minga ak nyufi deke. Bo feke ne chi at mi sa kom kom wesu na nyar fuka ak nyenti junei dalasi. Mbete wer bu neka dinga amluto lu si nyari junei dalasi. Lempo silangurgi di sukandeku ngi lige yokute reo mi. GRA mwai banghas bunguri gambia sas ngi rumu feye ku lepo lui lempo chibi reo mi. Betak na GRA di yegal fey kati lempo ine waru gala pur nyu fey lunyu nan withholding tax on contract payment. Ma nam bepa contract bu way joxe te ci bir rew mi lañu to kon xali ci contract bi ngeen nangoto war nga ci wañi ci xayma témer bu nekka fuka bu féké né contract bi dekku ci bir rew mi bu boba di nga waro wañi témer bu nekka fuka ak jurom li moy lempo bu ñu nan with holding tax on contract payment li moy lempo bi nga xamné yow mi joxe contract waru gal la nga wol baté ku dem fey ko ci makani GRA tax office bu la gëna jégué mbété ci banque yi GRA jagléel pour fey lempo war nga djebal lempo bi ci diri fuki fan ak jurom ganaw bi nga wagné ci xali ci contract bi amul ben contract bu ñu téggel fey lempo bi xana mu fekk né nguri gambia ñoko djégalé bolé ci project yi nga xamné mbotay ndimbali ñokoy dépense jra di fey ku lempo ngir yokuté réew mi ignore_time_segment_in_scoring ci loto gaming gambi bi la lal darnako lal na ci lu di waaw nga dafa am quarté am kenté am tiercé waaw manam nak tay ji kenté bi la té jackpot bi passé xaliss kenté moy lan kenté manam moy juroomi fass yi waaw benen bi am na quarté moy moy ñent fass yi ak tiercé tay nak xaliss bi dal gëna yok lu tax jackpot bëlé dañ ka tégat ci bi manam juroomi fass yi boko jappé ci ordre moy risque désordre bi sax day fay ignore_time_segment_in_scoring lu mu gatt gatt 50000 dalasi way eh eh tierno 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 wo wala ambulance lan lu xew ni sabay gay deno sam sam bab gay lu ko ray 500000 dalana ko boma gagnalon ci lima la yondi dama ko gay jox mu daanu ni sama xew man waxu mako mo waxe won la ko non yow la ko waron informer nak yow ya ko gagne ya gagne jappone Better and stronger as the sole ground operator at the Banjul International Airport With an expansion in travel services, customers are assured of GIA's capacity to cater for all their travel needs, provided by professional, experienced, and ever-smiling staff. 
GIA's Hatch package and services by far the best in the country give the customers the opportunity for a memorable Hajj experience. For a more efficient cargo services, GIA means business as it launches its new multi-million dollar ultra-modern cargo complex to revitalize and stimulate air transport. GIA, the pride of the Gambia. Gamsel data, now even better. Enjoy 20% extra data on all Gamsel data bundles. Buy 20 megabytes and get extra 4 megabytes. Buy 50 megabytes and get extra 10 megabytes. Buy 100 megabytes and get extra 20 megabytes. Any amount of Gamsel data bundle you buy, you will receive 20% extra data for free. Dial star 302 star. Data amount hash. Or go to your Yai bottom menu and choose your data bundle now. Gamsel data is fast. Last longer and very reliable. Gamsil Yai Borom.